Here in this short video, Luther gives a concise argument as to why work salvation, including the Roman Catholic false gospel, contradicts Holy Scripture. He wrote, Long before the time of Moses, God justified men without the law. He justified many kings of Egypt and Babylonia. He justified Job. Nineveh, that great city, was justified and received the promise of God that he would not destroy the city. Why was Nineveh spared? Not because it fulfilled the law, but because Nineveh believed the word of God. The prophet Jonah wrote, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, that is Jonah 3.5. They repented. Nowhere in the book of Jonah do you read that the Ninevites received the law of Moses, or that they were circumcised, or that they offered sacrifices. All this happened long before Christ was born. If the Gentiles were justified without the law and quietly received the Holy Spirit at a time when the law was in full force, why should the law count unto righteousness now, now that Christ has fulfilled the law? And yet many devote much time and labor to the law, to the decrees of the fathers, and to the traditions of the Pope. So the Ninevites simply repented and believed. They didn't keep works to merit favor with God. As you can see on the screen, Moses was born approximately 13th to 16th century BC. Jonah was set in 785 BC during the reign of King Jeroboam II of Israel. And this was many centuries after the law of Moses as Luther said, was in full force. And yet they were not justified by works of the law. They were not justified through their own obedience or through their own uh, good deeds. They simply repented and believed. They trusted in the word of God and therefore God was gracious to them. And you see this pattern is what is true from the first man, Adam, all the way until the last man, whoever he is, it has always been by grace through faith. It is always by means of repentance and faith that you are righteous and declared justified in the, in the sight of God. And the law of Moses was in full force. They were not required to keep the law of Moses. They were not required to be circumcised, but only to repent and believe. Now regarding circumcision, Circumcision and baptism correspond to one another as covenant signs illustrating the new birth. Colossians 2, 11 to 13. So both baptism and circumcision are the same in spiritual meaning or essence because both point to the mortification of the filth of the flesh, a radical transformation, the cleansing of the flesh, uh, the scriptures talk about circumcising your heart, which is a spiritual new birth or a, a radical transformation that comes by the Holy Spirit. So both baptism and circumcision correspond to one another as the covenant signs of belonging to God's people, belonging to God, that uh, God said, I will be a God to thee and to thy seed after thee in Genesis 17 regarding uh, in the context of circumcision and the covenant sign of circumcision. So if circumcision never justified anyone, as Paul argued of Abraham in Romans 4, then baptism never justifies anyone either, nor creates a new birth or automatically confers saving grace. So of course I would take big issue with Luther's view of baptismal regeneration, because if in fact as he said here, circumcision cannot justify anyone. They, they did not get circumcised in order to be justified or righteous or ha receive new birth. If baptism in, uh, corresponds to circumcision as the same spiritual meaning and uh, the sign, uh, then baptism cannot justify either and cannot create new birth. So I do think the church needed to reform uh, a little more after the time of Luther and his view of baptismal regeneration and even his view of the Lord's Supper. 
So what about Abraham? Notice in Romans 4, it clearly states that Abraham was not justified by works, and he was born around 2000 BC, centuries from Moses, centuries before Moses and the law of Moses. It says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. He cannot be justified by works because he can boast about his achievements, his merits, but he wasn't justified by works. And this is certainly not works of the law because the law didn't even exist yet. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. His faith, his trust in God and the promises of God, the word of God, resulted in his righteousness. He was reckoned as righteous before God. He was justified by his simple faith and not by any of his own works or striving or merits or achievements or obedience but he was justified by faith alone. And yes, it doesn't say faith alone, but the natural implication is faith in contrast to any sort of works. Verse four. So it gets even stronger in Paul's argument and Paul's view of justification and his view of faith. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. So if, you, if you're working for something, your wage is something that you have earned. Your wage is what is due to you. It's owed to you. It's an obligation that you're doing. It is not as a result of a favor from anyone. It is not from free grace. It is not a gift, as this word can be translated. It can be translated as grace or gift. But it is simply an obligation. What is due? What is owed to you? Because you're working for it, you're owed your wage. Verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Notice, we simply believe in him who justifies. The God who justifies justifies the ungodly, the undeserving, the unrighteous, not the one who works, not the one who is striving to enter heaven. Not the one who is trying to be good and trying to earn favor with God, trying to be good enough for heaven or to merit salvation in any sense. It is to the one who does not work but simply believes. The ungodly, the undeserving is considered righteous before God, is justified before God. It seems that verse 4, the working person, the striving person, describes the Roman Catholic, describes the Mormon, describes all works, salvation systems, but the one who does not work, but believes faith alone, in contrast to working, in contrast to merits, faith alone for righteousness and justification. This is the Protestant. This is the Bible-believing Christian. Notice Paul simply mentioned works, not works of the law or works of Moses. Abraham was righteous apart from any works of his own, and he was born around 2000 BC, centuries before the law of Moses. Therefore, justification before God has always been the same from age to age in human history, by faith apart from works. Otherwise, human beings would not, uh, human beings would boast in themselves or merely have the reason to boast not in the Lord. But we are to glory in and boast of the righteousness of Christ alone on our behalf. None of our own righteousness. Nothing in you can merit salvation. And to say uh, God by grace can cause you to perform meritorious good deeds is an oxymoron and turns the definition of grace on its head. You can end up making grace, which means unmerited favor, mean anything. You're enabled by God to merit unmerited favor this is simply an impossibility it's contradictory it's ridiculous the imputation of christ's righteousness second corinthians 5 21 he made him who knew no sin 
to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ knew no sin. He was innocent of all sin. He was perfectly righteous in all his ways. He only loved God, only glorified God. Every breath that he took was for the glory of God and perfect obedience. He knew no sin at all, but he became sin on our behalf, in our stead. He bore our sin on the cross. He paid the penalty that was due to us. He drank down the righteous anger of God on the cross, which God had against sin. He drank the cup of God's righteous anger so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ was treated as a guilty criminal, treated as disgraced, treated as an, uh, an unworthy sinner who deserved punishment because he actually became sin on the cross, bearing our sin on our behalf, in our place. It was a substitution that he bore. But if you are in him by faith, we become the righteousness of God. Our sin is imputed to Christ, and he's credited as a guilty sinner when he died on the cross. And his righteousness is credited to us who believe, who are in him by faith. And we are regarded and reckoned as perfectly righteous and obedient. We receive the obedience of Christ, the, the merits of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. We're treated that way. It's not ours in and of ourselves, but it is reckoned and regarded by God as ours. Just as our sin, he, him becoming sin on our behalf, it's not literally his sin, but it's reckoned to him. It's credited to his account. He bears everlasting punishment on the cross. He drinks it down for his beloved people who are in him by faith, that they would surely become the righteousness of God in him. And notice Philippians 3.9, And may be found in him, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God, on the basis of faith. Righteousness is on the basis of faith, and it's none of your own. It's not derived from the law. It's not from yourself. It comes from God on the basis of faith. Your righteousness is from God, 100%, entirely from God. It is by grace through faith that you're saved. It's by the perfect work of Christ that you are saved, for he was righteous on your behalf if you are a believer. And because you are in him by faith, you are reckoned as righteous. And Christ paid the full penalty, the full fine that you owed to the most high and most holy God. It comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul was not a Roman Catholic. Luther also wrote, true faith lays hold of Christ and leans on him alone. Our opponents cannot understand this. In their blindness, they cast away the precious pearl Christ and hang on to their stubborn works. They have no idea what faith is. How can they teach faith to others? Imagine having an all-sufficient Savior who died once for all time with perfect righteousness. He's, he's mighty to save. He's the king of all kings. He is the infinite God in human form. He is an all-sufficient savior, but you say, no, it's not enough. He needs to be offered continually by the priest at the mass. He's not enough. He needs to be re-presented as a sacrifice for sin over and over and over again, thousands and thousands, perhaps countless times in the Roman Catholic Church. And you need, you need confession and you need to go to the Mass over and over again. You need to perform your duties to merit salvation because Christ is not an all-sufficient Savior. His, his perfect righteousness is not enough and he's, his work is not finished even though he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. He sat down 
The priest is always standing up in the book of Hebrews. The priest is always standing up, continually offering, offering, doing this and that again and again and again, year after year. But Christ sat down because it is finished. There's no representation again of the death and sacrifice of Christ as if his suffering is in some sense or his offering is in some sense continual and perpetual. But it is a one time offer, which the book of Hebrews literally says. Since our opponents will not let it stand that only faith in Christ justifies, we will not yield to them. On the question of justification, we must remain adamant, or else we shall lose the truth of the gospel. It is a matter of life and death. It involves the death of the Son of God who died for the sins of the world. If we surrender faith in Christ as the only thing that can justify us, the death and resurrection of Jesus are without meaning. That Christ is the Savior of the world would be a myth. God would be a liar because he would not have fulfilled his promises. To believe in faith plus works for your justification before God is a grievous error and perversion of the true gospel, a matter of life and death. For you would be saying that Christ's death is not enough. His righteousness is insufficient because you need to add your own and you've contradicted the promises of God of free grace to everyone who simply believes. It is free grace. It is without cost. You freely come and partake of the water of life, Revelation 22.17. It is without cost. And that, that simple... That simple description throughout the scriptures that we have that it's without cost that you are saved it's without cost that you can come to god this illustrates that it is not by your own good works it's not by your merits but it is free because it is free grace luther later wrote a person becomes a christian not by working but by hearing the first step to being a christian is to hear the gospel when a person has accepted the gospel let him first give thanks unto God with a glad heart, and then let him get busy on the good works to strive for, works that really please God, and not man-made and self-chosen works. Don't live after the traditions of the Pope. Don't live after unbiblical uh, fathers who add more and more to the gospel, add more and more. But have biblical traditions. Follow the gospel. Legitimate good works are works of gratitude for an already saved person. They are not an instrument for anyone's salvation. Don't be self-righteous. Don't look to yourself for your salvation. Look to Christ who finished it, who has perfect righteousness, the all-sufficient Savior, the one mediator. Don't look to Mary. Are you saying Christ is not enough? That you need a co-mediatrix? You need a co-redemptrix? Because Christ is not enough? Christ is God in, in the flesh. How can he not be enough? How can he not be sufficient? How can his death not be a one-time offer that perfectly saves those who come near to God by him? That's what Hebrews says. It saves to the uttermost. It gives eternal redemption. They obtain eternal redemption. God bless and thank you for watching.